you have your Bibles with you, you can turn to the book of Ephesians this morning. Ephesians chapter 3. If you're using a pew Bible, it's found on page 1226. Let me begin reading in verse 14 of Ephesians chapter 3. Hear then the word of God. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory, to the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks for your word this morning. And as we come to it, Father, we give you thanks that you have not remained silent but you have spoken to us in your word. And as we come to it, we pray that you would give us understanding, but not just understanding in our heads, Father. We pray that we would understand to the very marrow of our bones. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Martin Luther, who is sometimes referred to as the father of the Reformation, had a very good friend. And his friend was also his assistant, and his assistant became ill, and his assistant's name was Friedrich Myconis. And in 1540, Myconis became sick, and he was expected to die shortly. And so he wrote a letter to Martin Luther explaining that he was sick and about to die. It was sort of his farewell message to Martin Luther. And when Martin Luther got this note from Myconius, he himself penned a response. Here is what he wrote. Quote, I command you in the name of God to live because I still have need of you in the work of reforming the church. The Lord will never let me hear that you are dead, but will permit you to survive me. For this I am praying. This is my will and may my will be done because I seek only to glorify the name of God. End of quote. You know, as I read those words, they seem rather bold. It might even be brash. (laughs) Um, But they are bold. And interestingly enough, Myconis did recover. And he lived for six more years. And he outlived Martin Luther by two weeks. (laughs) Answering the prayer that Martin Luther prayed. Might we pray that boldly. Well, in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul gives us a prayer that just might enable us to pray even as Martin Luther prayed. One writer calls it a prayer for the impossible, and that's a good description. This is, as you read the book of Ephesians, the second prayer that Paul gives us in the book of Ephesians. Several years ago, um, we spent some time studying the first prayer that's given to us in Ephesians chapter 1. That prayer was a prayer that says, might the Lord open the eyes of our hearts so that we might know God better. If the first prayer was one of enlightenment, then this prayer might be labeled one of enablement. If the first prayer is one that was asking God to give us more knowledge of who he is, this one is a prayer that God would give us more power. And so as we look at this prayer, it's easy to get lost in the details. In verse 16, Paul gives us the main request that he is praying, that God might, as Paul says, strengthen you with power through his spirit 
in your inner being. Paul prays for one thing and one thing only. He asks God to strengthen the Ephesians by the power of the Holy Spirit on the inside so that they can fulfill all that God has for them. And though this prayer has many parts, it builds to a climax. But there is only one basic request. And understanding why he's praying this, you need to go back to verse 13 and just take a look at verse 13 just for a moment. In verse 13, the prayer begins, I ask you therefore not to be discouraged because of my suffering for you, which are for your glory. That phrase, do not be discouraged, can also be translated, don't lose heart, don't give up. And that's extremely relevant because as we live the Christian life, there are many things that sap our strength. We have discouraging circumstances that sometimes take place in our lives. We have sometimes monotonous routines that we go through Monday through the following Monday. We sometimes are physically weak. We sometimes have health that is less than ideal, and for some, it's even failing health. We suffer personal failure. We sometimes have responsibilities that we know we have, but we somehow can't seem to get motivated to finish the responsibilities that we have. We sometimes have unresolved conflict within our own families, within relationships in the community. We certainly have global conflict. We certainly have acts of terrorism that sometimes cause fear within our own lives. Any one of those things could knock us down for a week or two or a month or more. But put two or three of those things together, and sometimes it's hard to get back up. And so seen in that light, this is a prayer for something most of us desperately need every day. Personal strength to keep on going. When we feel weak, prayer can be difficult, if not sometimes impossible. In those moments, here is a prayer that is always appropriate. It's a prayer to pray before you faint. If you're on the verge of giving up, this is a prayer you pray before you throw in the towel and say, I can't do it anymore. When we are weak, we need to be made strong. And strength is the exact opposite of losing heart that we find in verse 13. To be strengthened with power means to be made powerfully strong so that you can overcome whatever obstacle that you have before you. When you are made strong in the inner man by the Holy Spirit, there will be power to move away unbelief. There will be power to overcome despair. There will be power to rise above anger and bitterness. There will be power to keep on going when you'd rather quit. There will be power there to give you hope and to cause you not to be afraid as you move into tomorrow. As I pondered this request, it occurred to me how different it is than most of our prayers. This prayer is not... Lord, take away my burden. This Lord prayer is not, Lord, make life easy for me and get rid of all my problems. It's a, a prayer that asks God to strengthen you in the midst of burdens, in the midst of difficult times. And everything else flows from that basic request. The rest of the passage reveals three requests, three results that come as we're strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit. Christ dwelling in our hearts by faith, a growing comprehension of the love of Christ and a fullness of God in your life. Let me just touch on each of those quickly. First, Christ dwelling in our hearts by faith. The word dwell comes from a Greek word that's really made up a part of two words, kata and oikos. Kata means down, oikos means house. So this prayer is a prayer that Christ might be down home in your heart. It's a picture of a man who is at home in his own home. A few of us got a chance to go visit Bob Davis 
<clears throat> the other day, Thursday, and um, Bob has had one of his toes amputated. He has limited circulation in his foot, and so he's sort of um, confined to a chair. But we got down there. He's sitting beside a crackling fa- fire. He was down home. Many years ago, Bob Munger wrote a, a little book called My Heart, Christ Home. In it, he imagines the believer's heart, heart as a home that has many rooms. The heart has a living room, it has a dining room, it has a kitchen, it has a closet, it has a computer room, it has a TV room, it even has an attic. And in the little booklet, he talks about how too many Christians ask Christ into their lives, but if their heart is like a home, Christians ask Jesus into the entryway and keep Jesus in the entryway that Jesus never gets to move into the other rooms of a house. But the Lord wants to be in every room. He wants to enter your kitchen, as it were, your living room, your TV room, your computer room, your kitchen, your attic of your heart. But as long as we keep the door locked, Jesus never gets to be down home. And the question, therefore, is not how much of the Lord do we have, The question is always, how much of us does the Lord have? And so we might pray, oh Christ, come into my heart and purify my mind. Ennoble my thoughts. Guide my lips. Direct my steps. This then is a prayer for a deeper experience of knowing Jesus. Call it what you will, whether or not we refer to it as sanctification or total surrender or dedication or being filled with the Spirit. Until Jesus occupies every room in our house, until Jesus dwells within us, he in some sense, while he's in our life, in some sense will be a stranger. We want it so that he's just not watching us, He's with us. We want it so he's not just with me, he's in me. We want it so he's not just a visitor, he's at home in my heart. That's the first result of being strengthened by God in the inner man. Secondly, that there would be a growing comprehension for the love of God. You see this in verse second part of verse 17 through the first part of verse 19. <clears throat> The Greek word there, grasp, has the idea of holding on to something with all of your might. It means a growing personal experience of the love of God. There is a sense in which all Christians experience the love of God. But love itself has many dimensions. And Paul is saying, I pray that you may grow in your daily experience of experiencing the love of God the love of Jesus. He even says, I pray that you will come to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Dr. Kurzweil liked to talk about God's love in four dimensions from John 3.16. He would say, for God so loved the world, speaks of the breath of God's love. He included you. That he gave his son, speaks of the length of God's love. He sent Jesus to die for you. Should not perish speaks of the depth of God's love. He reached out to rescue you. And shall have everlasting life speaks of the height. He lifts you up so that one day you will spend eternity with him. And so this is a prayer that we might understand how much God loves us. Thirdly, that there is the fullness of God in your life. This is the whole idea of the Christian life. The word fulfilled has the idea of being dominated by something. If you are filled with rage, rage dominates your life. If you're filled with love, love dominates your life. If you're filled with joy, joy dominates your life. When you're filled with God, God dominates your life. 
It pictures the total transformation of the human personality by virtue of the presence of God by his spirit within us. It is an amazing thought to be filled with the fullness of God. It's such an amazing thought that we sometimes shy away from trying to understand what that means. To be filled with the fullness of God. As believers, we were created to be containers of God. That God's Spirit might indwell every part of our being. He desires to pour His life into us that we might once again reflect the image of God in all of our parts. Imagine if you, there was a big jar of muddy water and you wanted to make the water pure. One method might be to take your garden hose, hook it up to the spigot, turn on the garden hose, put the nozzle in the jar of muddy water, and slowly the clean, pure water displaces the muddy water so that over a period of time, you're left with a jar that has no muddy water in it. I think that's a parable for the Christian life. All of us are like the jar of muddy water. All of us are unclean. But as we allow the Spirit of God to come into us and to occupy every room in our being, God begins to cleanse us and to make us whole. And so we might pray, your love, O Lord, come in and drive out my anger. Your holiness, O Lord, might your holiness come in and drive out impurity. Your purity enter and drive out my lust. Your mercy fill my soul and take away my envy. Your grace fill me so that I can forgive. If we believe that in Jesus dwells the fullness of God, and if we believe Jesus dwells in our heart by faith, then we may believe that in our lives this week, the fullness of God, the beauty of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the holiness of God, the kindness of God, all that God is, fills us and begins to drive out sin and evil begins to drive out impatience and unbelief, begins to drive out anger and bitterness as the Holy Spirit changes us. No matter what we may think, this is not impossible. It is a daunting thought to pray, Lord, might you in all of your fullness fill me. And so we might say, how can this be possible? That is such a big prayer to pray that God would fill us with himself. And you might say, how does it happen? It brings us to the magnificent doxology that concludes this prayer. And the doxology reads, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more then all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Verse 20 in the New King James reads this way, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Both versions make clear that this prayer can be answered because God is able to accomplish this. God is able to do this. This is not something we do. This is something we pray, and then God does. John Stout points out that there are seven stages in this great doxology. One, he is able to do because he's not an inactive or idle or dead God. He can do what we ask because he hears us when we pray. He can do what we think for he knows what we think before we ask. 
He can do all we ask or think because He knows it all and can do it all. He can do more than we ask or think because His plans are bigger than our plans. He can do much more than we ask or think because there is no holding back of God. He can do exceedingly abundantly beyond what we can imagine because He is the God of the superlative. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And pay close attention to that phrase, exceedingly abundantly. That word means infinitely above and beyond what we humanly can measure. In other words, God's ability to accomplish what we've just prayed, God's ability to accomplish is off the charts. It can't be measured. It's so great it even can't be imagined. There are no limits to what God can do. We can't imagine what God can do. His power is so great we don't even have words to describe or ability to imagine what God can do. It's not our prayer that marks God's ability. He can do far more than we can pray. It's not our dreams that marks God's ability. He can do far more than what we even can dream. He is not limited by our prayers. He is not limited by our problems. He is not limited by our dreams or even our mere theories, our postulating about who He is. He is able to do exceedingly, abundantly more than we even can ask or even imagine. He is a great God. So how do we apply this? Let me first apply it to this church. Suppose the Apostle Paul was here this morning and the Apostle Paul was preaching to you. Paul would lift up his eyes to heaven and he would pray unto God. God might say to Paul, I can do more in this church than you ever can imagine. I can do more in this church than you ever could even ask. And so Paul would go out and he'd begin to do ministry and come back and he'd pray again. And then when he looked to heaven, God would say again, Paul, that's wonderful what you've done. But I can do more. I can do exceedingly more. And so he would strike out on another venture of faith. And God would say, I can do more. And Paul would continue to stretch himself and stretch himself beyond his comfort zone into the realms of the impossible. And what, no matter what Paul would do, God's response would be the same. I can do more. You know, we as a church have had a wonderful history throughout the years. In my tenure here, it, it's just been amazing, simply amazing how God has used you. Really, really has used you. I marvel at how God has used so many of you in so many different ways. Many of them quiet behind the scenes. I remember a couple years ago, the Tuesday group, Tuesday small group Bible study meeting here on Tuesday morning, decided they want, knowing Andrew and Amanda were going to come here, they spent almost a year taking care of the man so that when Andrew and Amanda came, they would have a warm, inviting place. And then it wasn't enough. And they decided we can do more. God can enable us to do more. So they went all the way to Corinna, to a different church, not affiliated with us in any way, and began to do work on the manse at that church to make a place that David and Jamie could be. And so many of you go into homes week after week, and you take meals, you sit down with a cup of coffee, and you minister. So many of you have brought new ministries to us. Shirley brought the ministry of 
of Lori Harvey and Janet Grant ministering in Haiti to the children in Haiti. You know, I wonder, as, as they brought that ministry, you know what I thought? You know, God can do more. And maybe instead of sending money, some of you might go to Haiti. Surely, some of you might go to Haiti and minister short term. Some of you know Dr. Eister. He leaves for Kenya in a week. He's gone to India. He's gone to the Ivory Coast. He's gone to China. Short-term missionary work. God can do more among us. We, God has been good and God has done marvelous things. But God can do more. Then there is the personal application that we need to make. When you are weak, pray to be strengthened in the inner man. This is a prayer that God always answers. All of us are weak from time to time. The pastor is weak from time to time. We're all sinners. We are made of clay. And we all need to be strengthened. And so we ought to pray, pray that Christ might be at home in our hearts, that we would have a growing comprehension of the love of Jesus, that the fullness of God might be reflected in our lives day by day. Our greatest need is the lack of strength. And so we need to pray this prayer. And our greatest temptation is to make an excuse. We always want things to be better. And so we say, take away this burden. Maybe we ought to just pray, Lord, the burden's okay. The burden's okay. Make me strong. That in the midst of my burden, in the midst of my weakness, in the midst of my physical problems, I might glorify your name. So then on the basis of this text, we are to pray boldly. At the end of the day, there is one final question our fearful hearts ask. Is God able to help me? I see how God is able to help others. Is God able to help me? No matter what I say in this sermon, no matter how many verses you may read, sometimes there is still inner fear. There is still doubt. And that fear and that doubt can erase hope. And so the question is, is God able? And the word of God to you this morning is, God is able. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly more than what you can even think or ask. You merely need to ask. Can we do that this morning? Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that your, your provisions are far greater than our needs. And we do come to you this morning, Father. We come to you in our own weakness and sometimes in our own doubt. And we grant, ask that you would Give us the gift of faith to believe in you, to lean upon you. And Father, this morning, in the midst of our weakness, teach us to pray big prayers that you might be honored in big ways among us. Thank you for what you have already done. We pray that you would continue to work in us and through us that you might be glorified today and tomorrow. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.